My teacher, then and for most of this search, was the Venerable Ananda Maitreya, former Vice-Chancellor of a Buddhist university, described in an address from the Buddhists of Burma as greatest of pundits, picked to represent his country on a visit to Mao's China. I was a bit scared to meet him, till I met him. When you see a figure of the Buddha, from his uh, eyes of the statues, it teaches you the control of eyes. It Rest teaches you control. Uh, control, uh, restraint of, restraining eyes. Control of your eyes. From the mouth, control of mouth. Control of speech, restraining speech. And uh, from, his, uh, from the hands of the, the, the statue, the restraint in hands, in your, in your activities. Uh, from the feet also, the restraint in feet. The whole body explains or expresses the restraint of whole body. So the control still, of our body. So the stillness of the statue isn't just a matter of being stone. It is an invitation yes. to emulate, to yes. do the same thing. Yes. I see. Yes. So there's the religion. There is the real dharma. The yes. doctrine is there. The doctrine um, symbolized. Ananda Maitreya lives in deliberate simplicity about 10 miles from Colombo. When I asked him what he thought his greatest weakness was, he said books. From his little house, he's planning a Buddhist study center for interested foreigners. In the meantime, he writes and teaches and receives visitors. If I say to you, can you put Buddhism in a nutshell? Yes. What would you do? The Lord Buddha said, Sabha papas akaranam kusala sopa sampada sachitta pariyodapanam etang buddhana sasanam which means Sabha papas akaranam to shun all evils. Kusala sopa sampada to do good. Sachitta pariyodapanam Purification of your mind, etang buddhaan sasanam. This is the teaching of all the buddhas. Yes. Not easy. Well, easy, very easy if you understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Getting the impression that a Buddhist is almost looking through a spyglass which is his mind, is almost seeing the whole world and everything through this lens of yes. the mind. Yes. So when you say purify the mind, is it the same as saying clean your lens? Um, clean your glasses? Well, it is somewhat like that. Then you can see clearly. If you purify your mind, then you can see the nature as it is, as real it is, the world as it is. There's the realization. So you would call Buddhism a severely practical thing of seeing the world as it is, not yes. seeing it painted gold no, or pink? No, no, no. You have to penetrate all the appearances. You have to penetrate it. And the Buddhist device for penetration, said Ananda Maitreya, is the noble eightfold path, the eight spokes of a wheel. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right thought, right understanding. So, and he used the eight spokes of his parasol to make the point, while we are tied to the cycle of birth and rebirth, we're on the perimeter. As we take the noble eightfold path, we move bit by bit down the spokes to the still point at the center. No more birth, no more rebirth, nirvana. When I asked a well-respected Buddhist monk about nirvana, he said, you can no more describe nirvana than a frog
can describe dry land to a shoal of tadpoles. And he went on to elaborate. Even the cleverest tadpole, he said, can only ask questions about the element he lives in. And all the frog's answers are going to seem negative. No, uh, dry land doesn't have fish. No, you can't float over it. No, fresh air is not like water. Until the tadpoles get the idea that he's describing some impossible, negative, nowhere. With earthly thought, said the monk, you cannot think nirvana. From nirvana, you cannot think an earthly thought. But the question remains, who is the Buddha? Is he supernatural? Is he God? Is he immortal? He's a man, an extraordinary man. From the very beginning of his life, he's extraordinary. That's the case, not supernatural. Natural, but extraordinary. It wasn't that Ananda Maitreya back in Sri Lanka exactly disapproved of that trip to India, but I got a strong impression that given the choice, he preferred live teaching to a dead relic. Ananda Maitreya's hometown, as you can tell if you see his full name, is Balangoda, because it's the custom here to make the name of your birthplace part of your permanent label. Balangoda Ananda Maitreya. He took me to the local temple to see the monk in charge, a man in his 90s. He's a great friend of mine. Oh, is he? Yes, yes. When I was about uh, 13, when I, in my school days, from my school days, yes. he was a great friend of mine. Oh, he, he's, he's much elderly. Yes. Is he very much your senior? Yes, about four years. The scenery is calculated from the day that you are ordained. So it's our custom that we have to pay respect to our senior. If he's senior to me, even in one minute, I have to respect him. In this society, it's no bad thing to be old. Who is this? This is the son of Prince Dharta. Son of the man who became the Buddha. Yes. And here is the Buddha. Yes. And he's very tall. Yes. Why is he so big? Well, uh, Buddha had two bodies, a spiritual body and physical body. The figure shows the nature of physical body. The yes. appearance. Yes, in appearance. But the height shows the height of his virtues infinite virtues. One thing about the temples we visited, they don't lead you to an altar. There's no holy of holies kept separate from the people with God one side and you the other. Tableau by tableau you're taken gently through a story, the life story of the Buddha. When you see statues in a temple, do you think of it as a kindergarten? Uh, somewhat like kindergarten class. Uh, that's the, the kindergarten section of the spiritual life. That's the beginning. Do people get stuck there? Well, <laughs> if they do get stuck, then there's no progress. This is a fledgling relative of the Buddha with his parents. He's been a novice monk for one hour exactly. If after five, ten or fifty years he decides to disrobe, nobody's going to stop him. So the events of an hour ago weren't as final as they looked. He has his head shaved. Why is that? Uh, for the simplicity's sake. While the shaving happens, the candidate is made to hold and look at a clipping of his own departing hair. It's his first lesson in meditation, they told me.
There was a nice informality about the style of the ceremony, but nothing haphazard about the timing. It happened at an hour and on a day that was astrologically exactly right. From Buddhist point of view, best astrological moment is when your mind is strong enough, full of self-confidence and energy. <laughs> Nevertheless, the astrological calendar had been consulted. In his lifetime, the Buddha ordained nuns as well as monks. At the moment, there are 15,000 monks in Sri Lanka and no ordained nuns, though there are moves from time to time to re-establish them. This is the last time he'll pay respect to his parents as a layman. The ordination proper begins with the three refuges. I take the Buddha as my refuge, I take his teaching as my refuge, I take the community of his disciples as my refuge. Hang Bhante, Pabbajang Yachami, Lutiampi, Hang Bhante, Pabbajang Yachami, Satyampi, Hang Bhante, Pabbajang Yachami, Pabbajang Yachami, Yachami. The language he's having difficulty with is Pali. That's the language of the earliest Buddhist scriptures. These are his new robes. A layman observes five precepts, five undertakings. Not to destroy life, not to steal, not to misuse sex, not to lie, and not to take intoxicants. As a monk, he'll take five more. Not to eat after 12 noon, not to dance, sing, or attend shows, not to decorate himself, not to use soft beds, not to handle gold or silver. <coughs> I asked Ananda Maitreya if ordination gave a man any special powers. That's the, something like a blessing from God or somewhat like that. There's no such thing in Buddhism. Because it is everything is you. You depend on what you do. You shouldn't expect any external help from a spirit or from anybody, for, for your own development. Now, and the boy himself could scarcely believe it, 
The parents and grandparents he'd bowed to ten minutes earlier queue up with presents and bow to him. With regard to a spiritual life, the boy is higher than the parents. Spiritually he is higher. Parents know this. The umbrella, by the way, is the thing he liked best. At the end of the day, as if he'd read my thoughts, Ananda Maitreya said, don't worry, for some time at least he'll be junior to every other monk he meets, and if he gets above himself, we shall help him down. A word you hear a great deal in talk with Buddhists is the word suffering. Being alive is suffering, dying is suffering, even being happy is suffering. If they're saying what they seem to be saying, Buddhists should have the world's longest and sourest faces. It was a relief to find out that the word you cling on to as you take your first steps in Buddhism isn't simple suffering. It's better translated as unsatisfactoriness, instability, uncertainty. Nothing ever stays the same. I'll try and put it to you as it was put to me. Here am I sitting comfortably in this chair. In an hour's time, I might still be quite comfortable. In 24 hours, I'd be in fair agony. In 24 years, I'd be a cripple. And in 240 years, I'd be bones. And the chair would be looking pretty seedy too. Even if you try to keep quite still and not change, change will still happen and there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. So, if, like most people, you're a clinging man in a world which never stops changing, what do you cling to? Some would say, God. Even the crowd at an English football match sings, O thou that changest not, abide with me. But Buddhists don't accept the idea of one unchanging, almighty God. The problem, they say, is man's problem. And the Buddhist solution, as far as I can understand it, is you must cling to nothing because there's nothing anywhere solid enough to cling to. And if you can't cling, however much you want to, you're faced with one unthinkable, terrifying alternative. You've got to let go. When a novice is at least 20, he can be ordained a fully-fledged monk, a bhikkhu. In this tradition, a bhikkhu doesn't eat after 12 noon, and what he eats, he begs for. Simply whatever house we see first, then we go there. If they offer us, then we accept. If they don't offer, then we pass over to other house. Do you collect food for other monks or in your begging bowl? Yes, just sometimes yourself? if there are a number of monks in a temple, so uh, we uh, collect uh, some food, even sufficient for others. I asked the laymen, the food givers, why they did it. Giving is the way to get inner wisdom, said one of them. But the rest talked about meritorious actions, gaining merit, like accumulating a store of spiritual riches that will help them to a better rebirth. I found myself wondering if it was difficult to beg. No, because 
when we join the order, naturally, we have to give up our pride, because we know we live on others. Even with an alien tagging on behind, the pace of the walk was deliberate and the concentration unbroken. Take two monks. One sits and meditates, one goes out and serves society. Which is more praiseworthy? Well, that depends on motive. The motive? Oh, yes. According to his motive, either this or that person is praiseworthy. I suppose I wanted him to approve of the bhikkhu who bustled about doing good. When we go on, arms begging. If we do it properly, properly well, I mean correctly, you have to meditate. You have to extend your love and kindness to the people who offer you arms. So you have to spread that loving feeling, that loving kindness, feeling of love and kindness towards them. It purifies even in that moment your mind. It is a kind of blessing, mental blessing. About the meditation on loving-kindness, I believe that you begin it by concentrating on yourself and loving yes, yourself. Yes, yes. Self-love, I was brought up to yes. believe, is an evil thing. Well, if it stops there itself, then it's, it may be an evil thing, but you don't stop there itself. First you love. It is natural that everybody loves himself, uh, better of all other persons. So. You have to extend your love. First, you, you have to experience your love on yourself, love for yourself. So you experience your love. Then you have to extend the very same experience towards all other living beings. Can a man who doesn't love himself then not love other people? Well, a man who doesn't love himself never loves others. It is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Come to think of it, the Christian Gospel says, love thy neighbour as thyself, not more than thyself, and certainly not less. But am I right? The Buddha did require his bhikkhus to serve. Uh, well, yes. For the benefit of the people, for the good of the people, for the welfare of the people. To teach and preach and help the people. So he sent out the first historical world mission. Before that, there was no world mission like that. It was the start of a world mission. And a mission, what is more, without bloodshed. <laughs> 